wondering, since um, Father Simon spoke, how dare I? How dare I stand here when our brethren are so persecuted? How dare I stand here when I do not know whether I would go to church under those circumstances? And I dare say I speak for all of you. However, I do have a task which I've been assigned, so I'd better get on with it. <coughs> I'm going to show you yourselves. Yes, well, I've got nowhere to prop it up. In St. Barnabas, I propped it up so that people could go on looking at themselves through the, through the entire sermon. But I can't do that here, so you just have to remember what you look like, and we'll see what we do about it. The Ten Commandments. In living memory, and I'm sure that Bill remembers this, and in most parish churches up and down the country, the east window would be framed in the Ten Commandments. There would have been up there and up there a statement of the Ten Commandments on both sides. Both sides, Bill, yes. And they would have been a weekly reminder to the faithful of the nature of right living. And they would have been there Sunday after Sunday so that nobody could escape what they said. If you think about them, they are a guidebook for wimps. They are not a signpost to those who seek personal power and authority. They are not signposts for the evolution of a race of supermen that Nietzsche might have imagined with his ubermensch. They are for those who speak rather of altruism, of unselfishness, of accountability to others, and in particular, accountability to God, a being above and beyond ourselves, our creator. So they do not point to what so often counts for success in the world in which we live. The attitudes which are engendered by the Ten Commandments are not those that you might find um, preached in um, personal um, enhancement seminars. They speak to us as those who live in relationship, for whom relationships are all important. They speak of horizontal relationships and they speak of vertical relationships if you in our imagination, imagine that God is up there. Of course, he isn't. Um, he's much more all per pervasive than that, but it, it is a nice geometric analogy, a horizontal set of relationships with our fellow human beings and a vertical set of relationships with our God, our supreme authority, worthy of our worship, our awe, our obedience. When Jesus summarized the law uh, in several places in the New Testament, but in particular I'm going to read from Matthew 22, he summarized it in this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great, greatest commandment. And the second is like it. 
love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Uh, do you spot a significant difference between the way that Jesus outlined the law, quite apart from the fact that it was much more succinct, and the way in which the Ten Commandments would have been emblazoned on that wall and bearing down on you Sunday by Sunday? What is the difference? What is the significant difference? One word, love. Love. It doesn't appear in the Ten Commandments, but it appears in the way that Jesus used the summary. Love. Well, how did the prophetic tradition regard the commandments? The prophets of the Old Testament. How did they take them? Well, basically they realized that the words on the wall were of themselves useless. Furthermore, they appreciated that the reading of those words was of itself worthless. Furthermore, that the understanding of what those words meant was also worthless because the whole thing is not about outward outward acknowledgement outward obedience it's about what is inside these words have to be internalized Jesus you see was not the first person not the first person to summarize the law in that way it is done in later in the New Testament in Deuteronomy where the Ten Commandments are restated in the next chapter. It does say, love the Lord your God. So very early on, people began to appreciate that it wasn't those words. It wasn't the negativity of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, don't do this, don't do that. But it was the positivity of love which was important. Joel says, rend your hearts and not your garments. Rend your hearts and not your garments because it was traditional to repent, to show your repentance by tearing your clothes. I don't intend to do that this morning. Um, it would be pretty embarrassing if I did. Uh, but rend your hearts and not your garments. Amos says, hate evil, love good. He doesn't just say, don't do evil and do good. But he says, hate, love. These are internalized words. These are words which actually influence our spirits, our souls, our minds, as well as our bodies. Isaiah says, stop bringing meaningless sacrifices. What's the good of them to show repentance, basically? That's what he's saying. Jeremiah says, uh, in, uh, quotes God, I will give them a heart to know me. And Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you to take away your heart of stone. You can act according to the commandments and yet have a heart of stone. Samuel said, man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. These words then have to be internalized. They have to become part of us. They have to become our very nature. Something that only will happen if we surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit and his work in our lives. Well, let's continue and think, how did Jesus regard them? Well, we've already heard that he quoted them in a particular way in a particular summary, but Jesus goes a great deal further than that and extremely uncomfortably further. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, I do not, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then later in the same passage, he says, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, 
do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, I assume that was some sort of swear word, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. And then, again, later in the same passage, he says, you have heard that it was said of old time, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus is looking much uncomfortably deeper into our hearts. What is in our heart is the thing that matters, not is what is on that wall at the front of the church, which isn't there anymore. I wonder why it isn't there anymore. It's an interesting question. Perhaps Bill can answer it, I don't know. Maybe it was a subject of discussions in the PCC. I don't know. <coughs> anyway, clear before us, clear before us, lies our total inadequacy in the blaze of God's and Christ's moral holiness. So, what do we do? Well, this is where the mirror comes in. James, that really, really lovely practical book, which those of you who take Scripture Union notes will have been reading only this last week. He says, the law is like a mirror. And uh, you don't look in a mirror and then go away and do nothing about what you see. The law is like a mirror, and I showed you the mirror, and you see what you look like. If I look in that mirror, have I shaved this morning? If you're a lady, have you put lipstick on this morning? There are three things, three reactions to what we see in our moral mirror. We can ignore it and go away, and James says people do that. We can ignore the seriousness of our moral ineptitude. And we can simply shrug our shoulders and say, well, at least I'm better than Joe down the road, and go off and, on your daily tasks and, and think no more of it. Or you can walk away in despair because you see that no way can we ever be good enough. So we live a despairing life. Or we can, as Paul wrote in Galatians, look to the law as our schoolmaster. Now, I know all about being a schoolmaster and, uh, you know, the wag of the finger or that sort of <laughs> movement of the finger, which was always very effective, I found. <laughs> so the schoolmaster, Paul says, leads us to Christ. The law is a schoolmaster which leads us to Christ. That's the third and correct response to what we see in our moral mirror, is we see that there is a way out. We don't have to shrug our shoulders and go off. We don't have to despair because the schoolmaster of the law shows us what we need to do, that we need to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his grace revealed in the cross of, his, of God's Son. For why were you yet sinners? Christ died for us. It is all of grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I read from St. Paul's, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verse 21. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by 
Christ Jesus. The uh, stick of rock called salvation has just one word in it all the way through, grace. Come now, says the prophet Isaiah. Come now is the invitation of the Lord. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Thank God that the commandments are not the basis on which our hope rests. The basis of our hope is the grace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.